Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small businesses and good stories in general. Welcome to episode 95 of Small Business War Stories. And today marks a really special occasion. It's our first ever repeat guest. So it took us 95 episodes, but here we are again with Seth Lee Jones of SLJ Guitars. And he is a great, great musician, and he makes guitars. He has actually been featured in a couple of articles that I've written for um, different publications about small business war stories, talking about the great rehoming. He went out to from Tulsa, lived in uh, L.A. for a while, and then moved back to Tulsa for... Um, basically to, to have an opportunity to start his business because the cost of living is lower. We talk about Seth's new record, uh, Live at the Colony, which is a great, great record. He actually also played some uh, guitar for us in the episode at the very end, so it's really cool to stick around for that. And uh, yeah, we uh, I think Seth is really going places. It's really cool to catch up with him, and I look forward to doing more follow-up episodes with folks in the future to kind of help uh, mark their progress throughout their uh, small business adventure. Without further ado, let's get into episode 95 of Small Business War Stories with Seth Lee Jones of SLJ Guitars in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we are live here in beautiful Tulsa, Oklahoma. And today I have the pleasure and honor to sit down with Seth Lee Jones. Welcome to the show. Hey. You are the first ever repeat guest on Small Business War Stories. Repeat offender. Here I yeah, am. Yeah, yeah. We're past a hundred episodes now of the, of the wow. show, and you were on in our third month, I think. Yeah. In March yeah. of 2017. They had a way different rig then too. Yeah. This is this is a little bit more uh, high tech here. Yeah. It's got, and you can hear yourself monitoring. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. So yeah, it's it's been really cool, um, you know, since I was just starting the podcast back then, and now I'm at the point where I've done all these shows, and I've gone around the country, and I'm collecting all these lessons from people into a book, um, but I wanted to follow back up with you. I drove all, all the way from Austin for your recent record release. Yeah, that's a heck of a trip for, yeah. for a small bar record it, release. Well, it was, a, it, was a hell of a, it was a hell of a show. It was last night, and uh, it's... Um, yeah, it's really cool to see all the things, like how you have evolved and how your business has evolved in the last year and a half. So I wanted to do a catch-up show and talk about that. I've been busy, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, you actually come to mind a lot. So I wrote an article, I think I sent it to you, where you talk about like the great rehoming, right? People going back home because the lower cost of living yeah. allows you to then be a part of a community and, and, and pursue um, pursue more of what you want to do, right? Right. You're, you're a big example of that. Do you, how long have you been back in Tulsa now? Uh, we're creeping up on, it's going to be eight years uh, yeah seven and a half something years it's, it's been a, a hot minute yep oh there you go there's the rig in the floor right, right. <laughs> still good yep and okay so and you were in la for how long before that i was in los angeles for 11 years wow um i got a great education there but i could not afford to live comfortably there yeah the quality of life that i really want to have like having a house and my own space to work I couldn't afford that there. Yeah. And I'd still be working for somebody else. Like I said that last time you had me on. Yeah. I'd still live there. I'd still be working for somebody else. So here I can afford to own a home um, and have all this stuff where it is and not have to go somewhere else to rehearse or, yeah, you know, everything's here because I can afford the square footage to do it. Yeah. yeah. You have a beautiful house, which you just paid off. Congratulations. I did. I just and paid it off. So you are now a proud uh, homeowner and shop owner because you have your awesome shop here as well. Yes. Low overhead having the, the shop in the house. I When I first moved here, I had an apartment and then I had a, a, a space that I rented for the shop and it, it's too much overhead Yeah, for a guy that just does repair and builds a few instruments a year. Is that a common thing for people who work in Luthery and, uh, you know, having dealing with like, okay, if you have to pay for a shop, it's uh, that's a really high nut to make every month. And how do you make that? Yeah. I mean, all the guys that I worked for in California, except for one, had uh, a shop and a house. Mm -hmm. So they were separate locations and you have to drive to work, you know. Uh, so you got your drive that you're paying for. You got your overhead on the building you're paying for. 
And for me, you know, I was driving over there and my thought every day when I got to work is I got to do like eight fret jobs before I can pay the rent on this building and actually start to make money. Yeah. So that's a lot of fret jobs. Yeah. It's a lot of wasted time as I see it. Yeah. I don't want to spend my life doing free fret jobs for <laughs> some crappy building next to a nail salon. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Let's talk about your record. So you just released this really cool record. It's called uh, Live at the Colony here in Tulsa. Yeah, uh, we recorded one of my Monday night gigs there. I have a, a, a standing gig there on Mondays. Uh, I generally have a guest every week. Uh, and I got the idea from a fellow named uh, Paul Benjamin. He kind of wrote the playbook on doing a weekly gig and having a guest, mm -hmm. uh, at least in this town. Uh, but we recorded that last October. Uh, we got it printed out in June, and then we released it the 21st of September, and we did a party about it last night, the 5th. Yeah, it was a great party and a great show. Yeah, good time. Uh, and it's a great record. I mean, I listened to it in Austin. I was telling you, uh, you know, you turned out, you you know, rolled on the windows, and the, the second song, Long Distance Call, is my particular favorite, but all the songs were really good. Yeah. I, let me ask you this. So, um, from when, I mean, I, I saw you 18 months ago, and we've been in touch a little bit, you know, in between there, about talking about building guitars and playing and such. But um, it seems to me, like when I read between the lines, are you being really kind of very successful on two different fronts? And that's got to be putting some tension in your life in a, in a weird way, right? Because you're, you're, you're playing, it's just really like a, another level. And like your, you know, your songwriting's come along and you're putting together some really cool stuff. And you also a lot, have a lot of demand for your instruments, for your telecasters and your other instruments that you make. Right. So how yeah. do you, how do you balance this out? Like the fact that I don't, <laughs> <laughs> There's, I got people mad at me cause their shit ain't done. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's a thing that I deal with cause there's practice time, you know, by myself, there's rehearsals and I play for uh, another band in town, a guy named Jared Tyler. I play for him every Wednesday, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then I've got the repair business and then there's the building business Yeah, and going out and playing my weekly gig. So I, I mean, I technically have, three jobs here, yeah you know that's what uh, I, that's kind of what gigging, I was getting repairing at. and making are three different things that yeah. don't really uh make time for one another um the building and the repair they get in the way of each other all the time being i have a small shop it's you know it's like a two-car garage so if i got a couple workbenches tied up with resto i'm not doing any building that day yeah you know, i'm just a one-man band over here i have a a guy that helps me, uh, my friend John Nath, who's retired, he helps me during the week when he can. Yeah. Um, but that's all the help I got going on. Have you thought about uh, what it would be like if you were to bring more folks on and like expand the capability to do things? Well, I've had it happen to me twice now where it's kind of a conflict of interest where you train somebody up to help you with repair work and then at a certain point, they don't need you anymore and they can go off and do their own repair work and make all the money. Yeah. So what are they going to come over and work for me for? for peanuts when they can make the whole repair right you know uh so then you got one more competition in town uh, but that that's for repairs but what about the the guitar making business uh well i had a guy helping me with that too and i had to answer the phone and came back in and a bunch of material got ruined so i just decided i didn't want to do that it's so funny there, you said there's that certain portions of it i cannot turn over to anybody because it's funny you said that. Yet, literally yesterday in the helix metal wars podcast jeff told me about a time where he like almost literally that happened and uh the guy that he had helping him ruin i think eight thousand dollars worth of damage onto a lathe <laughs> yeah yeah i had well it wasn't quite that much but i had about five necks take a dump whenever i went to answer the phone oh the guy scooped the headstocks way too close to the nut just ruined them mm. so it is what it is there's a learning curve for him unfortunately he didn't stay on yeah so uh i had to eat that one you know, and the neck wood wasn't such a burn, but the rosewood, that stuff gets expensive after a while. Yeah. So. Yeah, and we just collaborated on making a guitar where you actually used uh, some rosewood and made a beautiful, beautiful neck. Yeah, it came out really good, man. Yeah. I'm happy I'm, with it. I'm super stoked. Thank you for, yeah. for working with me on that. Yeah. yeah. Lots of different people. Actually, lots of people who've been on the podcast collaborated on this one. Uh, yeah. Matt, Matt Ike from Mule Rosophonic provided some of the parts and about the armadillo guys he, he has michael has not yet been on the podcast but oh, i do want to have him then, on huh? he's awesome he's he's a great guy he runs a machine shop in oh, austin his, his parts look great 
Yeah, he he makes high quality work. And I was thoroughly prepared to not like that bridge pickup. I was yeah, pleasantly surprised. Or or the yeah. my craftsmanship. Or, or your craftsmanship <laughs> on the, the ring. The, the ring looks awesome. Yeah, you took your time with it. It looks good. You fitted that mule bucker into that guard nicely. It's yeah. tight. Thanks, man. Yeah, you yeah. coached me on a lot of these things. Uh, you, you've yeah. been very helpful. You got you did a good job, and I think a majority of it is because of the patience. You took the time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. what. What was you saying? You you told me earlier in the shop today is that to be a guitar maker, you basically just got to be ready to sand a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's like ninety percent of my job is sanding. Yeah. So and su super patient to make yeah. sure the tolerances and things are right. Yeah, yeah. You want to make sure it's you know within the tolerance for yep. sure. Yep. So what? Are, where do you see going forward? I mean, you're uh, you just went to Kansas City, I remember, not so long ago to uh, to play there. Oh, I went with Jared Tyler on that gig. That okay. was uh, that was with his band. Okay. Um, so, I mean, what what happens if you, I mean, your, your, your stuff's spectacular. So check out Seth Lee Jones' uh, Live at the Colony album. You'll see what I'm talking about. And, you know, a, if you were to start touring, that would definitely eat up into your ability to spend time in the shop, right? Well, here's the thing about touring. It's got to be making more money than what I'm making in the shop. Right. So that's the conflict there and that I'm not going to do something that's going to put me out because uh, I make a good living doing what I'm currently doing. Yeah. Uh, the music is a side hustle for me. Yeah. And it's enjoyable. It's my therapy. Yeah. It's what makes me happy. You know, yep. uh, I feel like if that were to become a job, it, it might make me want to not do it anymore. You know, yeah. if I had to do that and write pop songs or something, I probably wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. Um, right. Because then you have to worry about, did it sell as opposed to did it move me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I play that stuff because, it makes me happy. If somebody else gets happy about it, good for them. I'm yeah. happy for them. But uh, I don't chase music the same way some of the people I know do. It, it's uh, it's more therapy for me. And if I get to make some money doing it, awesome. Yeah. Uh, if not, I can at least make 50 bucks a man every Monday yeah. <laughs> for my little bar gig that I play. That's awesome. So. So tell me more about, uh, in, as your business has evolved in the last year, I mean, your shop has definitely changed in the last year. Your, a lot of things in your life have changed. What, what's something that you've picked up and learned along the way that's helped your business and helped your ability to, to run things better? Well, I've been trying to be better about delegating my time to the projects that are going to pay the rent, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or the mortgage in that case. Um, I feel like now I've got a little bit more freedom that the house has paid off. I don't have to worry so much about that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, also looking at a project and going, well, I'm not going to get all this done today, but I can do this part of it. So yeah. taking on uh, multiple projects, particularly when you're looking at a resto that takes weeks to do, you got to take something completely apart down to the white, or you got to disassemble something and say, well, I can take this part off today. And I could take that part off today. And the next day I'll take that one and this one. And you just work on a little portion each day in between your duties that pay your bills. So if I got, you know, some pickup swaps and some setups sitting there that I'm going to do that day, yep. I'll take one out of the bin that's a big resto and pull the bridge off it, put it back in the case. So then when I get back into that thing, he's already one step down the, down the way. Yeah. And uh, just working on multiple things at once. Uh, but without getting too divided in your attentions. Yeah, how do you how do you negotiate that? Because I, I personally struggle with that. Oh, um, it's still a struggle. I don't think I'm doing that great of a job, but I'm I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's getting there. But I really appreciate what you said about the little by little because I've had some struggles recently with like the way that I work and the way that I do things. Uh, and like, you know, how do you reduce the focus I mean reduce the the, the focus loss that happens when you shift from task to task, right? And, yeah. a, and a lot of it is like the psychological, like, ah, oh, shit, like there's this enormous mountain of work ahead of you. Yeah. Instead of thinking about that like little, and it sounds so cliche, but like I forget about it all the time about like, okay, you're going to do one thing. Yeah. It's like when I just moved houses, like I had one room that was full of boxes and I'm like, oh my, the only thing I need to do is one box a day. Yeah. And if everything totally. happened, like, you know, just unpack one box a day and then by the end of a month, it'll be completely done. Sure. You know, I mean, you take this house, for instance, like when I first moved in here, this place was a wreck. I mean, it was... It had the siding and the windows redone on it, and I had helped with, with some of that, and we had just sprayed two days before we moved in here. We sprayed all the walls, all the ceilings. There was paper on the floor, and you know, yeah. we moved in. There was a lot to be done. You know, There was still some some really big problem areas, and 
we just tackled them one at a time and now it's got a roof on it now it has mini splits in it now it has a furnace now it has gutters you know that whole backyard i mean we're talking 36 loads double axle trailer to the dump yeah i mean layers of carpet and garbage i mean this and you cleared out the school bus a little bit at a time yeah the school bus had a ton of wood in it yeah and thousands of pounds of trash and just scrap metal and junk yeah it didn't all go away in a day yeah thanks for the walnut bow you gave me some yeah. really cool yeah, walnut. you're very welcome and that's got a cool story to it yeah that walnut was cut down somewhere in Neosha and uh set in that bus probably since the mid 80s yeah and it's case hardened you're gonna find that out for yourself when yeah. you go to because when, when i that. when i work it so what does that mean it chips easier uh well uh it's brittle and uh it's hard to work because it's uh it's really really uh dense hard yeah. material it's hardened but as long as you get the i mean we'll talk about it later but like the router and the template right yeah you'll be fine it, it machines nice it's it's just uh when you shape it it's gonna fight you it's, yeah it's hard hard material yeah i use those dragon rasps yeah you'd be all right but you'll feel it yeah yeah cool man for sure so what what's what's next i mean how do you how much do you are you living kind of by the seat of the pants and figuring out okay like you got this great music stuff a uh you have a you know you're following it on social media is great because you have a very innovative style of, style of playing the guitar um but uh what's as you plan out like do you have any specific goals and things that you're looking for for the next couple of years well um especially after talking to matt ike I've, he's got such a brilliant business mind for how to get things where you have uh what i call static income stuff that you can do that's making you money yep. without having to mm-hmm. go into the shop and swing a hammer um i need to somehow set up a way where i can do online lessons with some sort of subscription type of a deal yeah and you know the chart that i have that i've showed you i need to be able to sell that yeah uh, I, we'll talk about it afterwards and definitely yeah. we'll make some plans because i think and there's you know the bender thing that's that's a really integral part of of the style that i've developed is yeah i need to be selling that bender with the handles that I use. Yeah, because you made trees. some custom handles for yeah, mine. It, it's got custom handles that are more ergonomic for your hand to sit on. They're, they're actually usable. The ones that come with it are junk. You just need to throw them out as soon as you get it. Yeah. Uh, that's a whole other story. Can you tell the story again of that? Uh, so yesterday off off uh, off the tape, you told me that um, the story of how... So just to so listeners can I get a picture of this? Uh, Seth plays a Telecaster that it has a couple of things that are different about it. So one of them has a flat fingerboard, more like a Spanish, you know, classical guitar, which allows you to play slide easier. And then also has um, three benders that are kind of like a pedal steel. It have, they make a pedal steel like yeah. sound. Yeah, yeah, totally the and, same technology. Yeah, and they take uh, they basically take uh, two of the strings a full step and the other one a half step. Yeah. And so tell me, you told me a great story yesterday about how this all came about. You, you called it like the little Bob Ross happy accident, right? Yeah, it's a happy accident. I, I definitely made those into little birds. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for a shop in Venice Beach called Carruthers Guitars when I first started doing this. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I first started there, they let me make a guitar for myself. And it was that white telly that I play. Yep. And I made the body over there and took it back to the valley and got it all painted up. And I made the neck over there and took it back to the valley and got it all painted up. And when I got ready to put the thing together, the neck was back bowed. Well, Venice Beach is very moist over there. And where I lived in the valley was really, really dry. Mm -hmm. And I tried cooking that thing to get it to give me some bow. And it wasn't happening. It was just back bowed, warped. So I was kind of bummed. I wanted to learn some Brad Paisley licks. And uh, I put that bender on there because I didn't have $1,200 for a McVeigh bender. Yeah, <laughs> that's what he uses, and they're they're probably the best ones out there. And those are hard to install too. Yeah, you, it's, you, you have to send back. it to them. Yeah. yeah, they they do the install. Nobody does those. But um, I had no intentions of making a slide guitar with benders on it. Yeah, you know, I've had a lap steel since I was a teenager, and I've always been into playing slide guitar. Sure. Uh, and having like crappy harmony sovereigns with high action and playing a slide on those that that always was fun. Mm-hmm. But when I made that telly, I wanted to learn some country licks and have a b-bender you know uh, get into some of that b-bender stuff and it just didn't work out i put that thing together and it was a massive failure uh, the neck was uh, foobard as we call it sure so my solution to that not wanting to remake a neck because i'd already moved on to another project i said well i'm just going to put the biggest set of strings i can find on this thing and i'm going to leave it out in the yard <laughs> 
and that's what I did with it for two or three years was I had 13s on it and uh, it lived in the backyard trying to get that neck to work which it never did you were trying yeah. to get it to over yeah time, I thought for some reason that might it back help it or something. and it doesn't rain much in California and it's pretty much perfect weather out there so you can do shit like that yeah uh, but it, it gave you know a nice color to the lacquer. It, it yellowed it up a bit. Yeah, that guitar was originally white. It does not look white anymore. No, it's like, <laughs> like butterscotch looking now. But uh, it dawned on me that those benders actually did something cool when you push down on them when you're an open E. I was like, well, that's kind of kind of neat. And you can adjust the throw of them how far they go. You can do a whole tone, a half tone, a whole and a half tone. Uh, depending on the gauge, you can do two whole tones. Uh, so after toying with gauges and finally getting it where I was happy with the gauges, I realized that for the bar to be flat against the strings, I had to have my high E and my low E higher than normal because the fingerboard is round. Yep. I was, you know, all these nationals that I was working on when I worked for Crothers, a lot of them were pretty flat. I was like, why don't I make a neck like that? Mm -hmm. So I made a neck with no radius in it. And that was like the game changer because I didn't have to, you know, roll my hand over trying to get, uh, the notes that were getting missed by a flat bar. Right, right. Um, unless, well, unless you go real high off the nut, I guess. Yeah. Well, that, that's how it all came about, though. It's purely by accident. Yeah, and now, so, th and that enabled you to develop a style of playing and a, and a sound that's actually very, very unique. I mean, I've, uh, I'm a little bit of a, you know, music and blues nerd, and I've seen a lot of stuff, and like, yeah, nobody else is doing what you're doing. As far as I know, um, I know there's a guy up in Canada that's capable of it. Yeah. <laughs> this is a fellow named Joey Landreth is a murderous guitar player and he uh he can do it, man. Yeah. And when I was up there visiting Matt, he picked up my guitar. He he was right at home, man. Yeah. It's brutal. Yeah. Hurt your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I think those things yeah. you know, it adds it adds yeah, to yeah. the art. So Matt Matt, you're referring to Matt Ike, Matt Ike from yeah. uh, Mule Resonators. Mule Resonator. And uh he um he still is the most, I was telling you right before we started here, the most listened to episode of the history of small business war stories. Wow. And he had a lot of really cool, you, you just went to visit him, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what, what was that like? Uh, Saginaw's a really cool town. There was a lot of manufacturing there at one point. Yeah. Uh, there's quite a few abandoned buildings and structures that I really would like to see restored. It's a beautiful town. Lots of really neat craftsman mm -hmm. style houses. We went up there and uh, he made a guitar for me that I did some consulting on when he was uh, in the inception stage of it. And I made one of mine for him. Mm -hmm. uh, both of these guitars have the bender and the slide set up. And I wanted to hand deliver mine, come up and hang out with him because I bought a guitar from him, I guess four years ago, I mean five years ago. Right when he first started, I got one of the first hundred uh, resonators that he made. Yep. And uh, I drove up to pick it up. Yeah. Me and my buddy both bought resonators and we drove up and picked yeah. them up. Which was really neat. He had his shop in the basement of this house he was renting, and it was like a dungeon, man. It was yeah. Kind of scary. Now his shop is awesome. Yeah, his shop now is in a really cool industrial building yep. close to downtown. Yeah, it's the big, guy, big floor plan. Yeah, beautiful maple floors, and uh, he's got a really neat setup there. He's got like four guys working for him. They're on like number four hundred and seventy something. I own three thirteen. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, and the the mule caster that I have is I think the third one that he made. Okay. Um, but yeah, he, uh, he wanted one like mine and I got one of his and it was a straight up trade. Yeah. And we went up there to bro out for a little bit. That's you know, awesome. So yeah, day. that must've been a good time. I mean, I know both of you guys, you guys, uh, yeah, that must've been a, a oh, great nerd alert. Time. Yeah. Straight nerd alert. <laughs> it was like people in the room were listening to us talk. It was like, sound like throwing spoons or something. You yeah. Know? You're just talking about like yeah. all the intricacies of making yeah. guitars and all Just that. flapping gums, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me more about that aspect of it. So you and I talked a little bit about how sometimes between builders and between luthiers, there's like this kind of sense of competition, but sometimes there's a sense of camaraderie. And like, I, I kind of feel like, so I've met a lot of really interesting people around the country and, I, yeah. and I've met a lot of people who just have this like kinder vibe. You guys are, you know, brothers and sisters. You guys don't know it yet. Yeah. Um, and you and Matt seem to me like you're both part of like the same guild, you know, like a trade. So how, when, whenever you guys connect, like how, what's that like? And what enables you to see him as like a, that's this collaborative force that helps you as opposed to somebody who competes with you? Well, I mean, we make similar things, but both of them are, are different from one another. Yeah. And, you know, 
there's a thousand ways you can make something, no matter what it is, a piano, a chair, a car, a guitar. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're making it, there's so many different ways to do it. So, you know, how I do it might work for me. It might not work for him. It might not work for anybody but me, you know, but it's getting it done. That's important. So we, we bounce ideas off of one another and it's more of a community effort than it is a competition. That's more of a furthering the art. You know, this stuff is, is, uh, realistically dying out. I feel like, you know, people, you think that, so? Yeah. People that make things by hand. I mean, everybody does a CNC machine now, you know, there's very few people that actually still make stuff, particularly in this country. You know, it's like a lot of manufacturing is going elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, and it's particularly like, you know, craftsman stuff like furniture and, and instruments, you know? So the more we communicate, uh, with each other and, you know, like you asking me about how to cut that pit guard, the more that you do those things, you're going to tell somebody else that you do those things and they're going to try to do those things. So it's like you get the snowball effect where I tell you, you tell somebody else, they tell a friend and everybody tries to do this thing again. Yeah. That's a lost art. Yeah. Uh, and it keeps it alive. You know? Yeah. I love that, that sense of transmitting knowledge. So I had a kid, I got started making cigar box guitars and I had a kid named Kevin Kelleher who's uh, who's actually, he's turning into a murderous guitar player. He's at Berkeley College of Music now. But he oh, reached dude. out to me when he was a senior in high school and he was doing a senior project. So I basically taught him the steps of how to build a you know cigar box guitar, and there he built go. his uh, his first instrument based on that. So Killer. Kevin, Kevin, if you listen, I, I'll send you this episode. But uh, yeah, you guys should, should both check each other out. But especially, actually, Kevin should probably check your stuff out. He's but he's he's awesome. Killer. But yeah, th that feeling of passing that knowledge on is really good. And I think tying it back to what you said about how do you share your knowledge, I think that's really powerful because. Going back, like kind of tying everything we've talked about together. So tying together the, you know, passing on the knowledge and how, where we started with like the return home, right? The, the sure. fact that you live here in Tulsa, but being able to reach a global audience with your information, with your videos, with your products, uh, that enables you to be a part of the community here, go to the colony, um, and also spend your money here, which yeah. brings, you know, strengthens the Tulsa economy and like the, you know, sure. everything, everything gets better around here. So, yeah, how do, how do you think about, um, you know, like this foray? Because it's going to be, you've been remarkably proficient at learning both music and, and how to make guitars. And um, in an interesting way, like you go into something where you're completely new at it, right? And to like, how do you um, effectively sell a lot of these things? So how do you take that like a beginner's mindset again, where you're such a, at such a different level on these other things? And how do you approach this process of learning so that you can uh, effectively do this? Failure is uh, really important to getting good at anything. Yeah. If you're going to try to do something, you need to jump in with both feet and fail miserably. <laughs> you you got to break over. eggs to make an omelet. And yeah. that's the only way you're going to get good at something is trying it. You know, when I first started doing this uh, slide guitar thing. I played a lot of foul notes, man. Yeah, I still do. Dude, <laughs> and that's how you know you're going to get there. You know, if, uh, I tell people a lot of times when they ask me about learning how to play is that uh, if you're practicing at home and you're not bothering somebody, you're not doing it right. Yeah. Like whoever's in the house needs to be like, would you shut the fuck up? Like, <laughs> I remember hearing that from the other room. Like, I can't even tell you how many times. Yeah, because that means you're trying new things. Yeah, you're in there and goofing off. or Yeah, well, or, you, you have a great saying about practice too, right? Which is, uh, I, I actually, it impacted me so much the last time that I visited you that I wrote it. It's on my practice board in my, in my uh, music room, which is a, uh, um, I'm staying into practice because nobody's going to congratulate me on how good my drinking's gotten. Yeah, well, it's the truth, <laughs> yeah. for sure. And you practice on Saturday nights. You're very proud of that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, my girlfriend Rachel works uh, Saturday night. She closes the bar down, and uh, I generally don't have a gig on Saturday night unless it's a, a good gig with Jared Tyler. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and if I'm at home on a Saturday, I will plug all my gear in and and play and yeah. try new things and try to work on those licks that I can't quite land in the in the bar setting or in the gig setting. You know, and Monday is kind of a trial place too. I, I don't quite do what i'm doing at home but um you know practicing on saturday night is uh something i'm proud of because when people are like yeah. hey it's saturday let's go out and drink too much and not get up at a reasonable hour on sunday 
Yeah. Like I'm in here practicing until yeah. 1230 you at night. On your Instagram stories. Yeah. And I'll go to, to pick Rachel up afterwards and, and hang out and have a drink. But, uh, um, it's important to get that practice in by yourself when nobody's around. There's no, like, uh, you don't put that judgment on yourself from the other room. Oh man, I'm putting them <laughs> through all I this suck. noise. You know, <laughs> I always feel bad sometimes whenever she's here and I'm playing all loud in the living room here, because it, it's it's yeah it's annoying. I'll work on like the most annoying lick <laughs> ever, just sitting in there wanking, dude, just literally just wanking. Yeah, that's, uh, so that's another that's another really good piece of wisdom. It's like if you if you're practicing and you're not bothering anybody that means that you're not doing it right cause you're not yeah. stretching yourself enough and learning yeah. things you're not playing any foul balls man yeah so how That's, do you how do you translate that into what you're about to embark here with uh you know the, we talked about the possibility of patreon the possibility of like different ways to you know put your content out there and kind of own this this bender slide thing well i mean i've worked so hard at getting this far with it practicing and when I was up there visiting with Matt, we were having this conversation uh, uh, about, you know, moving forward. And I was like, you know, look at this Greg Klassen guy. He makes these $10,000, $25,000 fucking tables. It's like, I should make something like that. It costs more than a fucking guitar, you know. Uh, and he's like, no, you just need to figure out how to market what you're already doing. Uh, you don't need to be making tables, dude. Like, you spent years learning how to do that. Yeah. Uh, this bender thing, learning how to play that thing that way. Uh, like you need to somehow harness that energy yeah. that you already have, not embark on some new project that you're not going to be really happy doing. Yeah. Like this makes me happy. I've already gotten to a point at it where I'm good enough to have a record out and the guys show up every week to play with me. So <laughs> that's awesome. I just need to figure out how to harness what I've already got going on and make it work for me Yeah, and get a static income going. That's kind of my goal for the next two years is to get serious about lesson plan and get serious about putting this kit out yeah. for the vendors so that somebody can drop it on their telly and not have any issues. It just drops right on, ready to go. Yep. Um, that's the goal. That's awesome. That's awesome. Do you want to plug in and play some for 30 seconds here before we wrap up the episode? Uh yeah, I gotta get it all out. It's still packed up from last night. Is I can it? Do that. Oh, you can grab the the orange one. Uh, you just plug it in, right? Well, we pause it, and I'll plug the real shit in. All right, sounds good. Yeah, we'll pause it. Yeah. Right. This is Seth Lee Jones playing his guitar with slide and benders. <laughs> And that is officially the coolest sign off ever to Small Voices War Stories. Thank you so much for sharing all your stories. <laughs> You're very welcome. It's yeah. good to have you. Yeah, it's, it's awesome to be back here in Tulsa. And hopefully we'll do another follow up in a couple of years where you're uh, kicking ass with all your content. I'll be here. Sounds good. Thanks. Small Business War Stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.